Good afternoon to everybody. Thanks you for being here. Um, my task is to present, uh, to complement Luigi's presentation with an overview of alternative views about what let me call the consensus narrative, the consensus view about the problems that Luigi has presented. If you think of uh, Baldwin, Javazzi, and others paper, which is exactly entitled how to construct a consensus view, by and large, you find this kind of explanation and narrative. And I also will stress one further point, how this view of the problems that have uh, and develop, uh, developed themselves during the crisis has fed this uh, instrument that we have in the uh, Eurozone governance, which is called the macroeconomic imbalances procedure. The, uh, this, this alternative view that do not deny, of course, what uh, actually is a matter of fact and find, of course, some uh, element of truth in the conventional, in the consensus view, however, point out a number of issues that I think is, are interesting to, to discuss and to know. And these are, can be broadly organized in three aspects, the relevance and uh, relevance and normative issues with the narrative and the MIP, uh, the causes and connection with the crisis, and uh, the policy implications. I will merge the first two points in one single, and then I uh, will uh, conclude with some uh, considerations about the policy implication of the MIP approach. Uh, I will organize this discussion al along two, the two dimensions of uh, the whole question of uh, macroeconomic imbalances and the approach of the MIP, which is a domestic one uh, by, means, by, mean, uh, by which I mean the economic disparities, divergency in the determinants of growth rates, per capita incomes, unemployment, etc., and the external dimension, which uh, refers to large and persistent current account imbalances. So uh, the first uh, question, as I said, merges the first two points that I mentioned before. So why are macroeconomic imbalances so important in the Eurozone? What is the relationship uh, of this problem with the Eurozone crisis? The first starting point, which is rather obvious but is important to keep in mind, is that most of the time open economies or regions within the same national borders or follow different growth paths different uh, growth of prices, wages, population, capital, employment, and these differences quite naturally lead to large trade and capital flows. These different economic trajectories may embed long-term troubles as to their sustainability, but identifying unsustainability and pathological um, macroeconomic imbalances is, however, a difficult task, and this is uh, where these uh, views that I will present uh, stress. Uh, so the MIP scoreboard certainly seeks to come to terms with the complexity of uh, macroeconomic imbalances diagnostics. However, as I said, th th there is this idea, this number of ideas that I will present, according to which the whole MIP approach appears questionable, if not in some aspect uh, misleading. These, uh, uh, so let's start from the domestic dimension. These are the four issues that um, you will find in the paper when it will be completed. Um, and I think that perhaps the most interesting uh, ones to be discussed. So um, where uh, are economic disparities located? This uh, is a question that cannot longer be evaded. Already, had b much of this has already been touched in, the, uh, in Luigi's presentation and in other sessions in this conference. So very quickly, the geography of disparity does not overlap with that of national borders, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know. Each national country has its own disparities, uh, while it shares forerunning and laggard regions with others and that's an important thing, the cross-border problem. Um, this creates serious problem, foremost for policy purposes that can no longer be ignored if disparity is simply read at the national level as is usually done. And let me remind two lessons from globalization that are important. 
The first is that disparities within countries may become more important than, um, than across countries. And the former, the within disparities, may increase while the latter are reduced. These are two well-known hard lessons from globalization that we should keep in mind. Uh, second question, how large are large disparities? Um, from this point of view, it's, it's, it's necessary that to assess how large and dangerous, broadly speaking, of course, uh, disparities are, we also need a normative benchmark which is seldom provided. Uh, so deeper comparative analysis, especially with large uh, federal monetary unions, may be helpful. Uh, with a well-known caveat, uh, optimal currency area provides an important normative benchmark, but it does not exist in reality. And it is a matter of degree, the distance from that benchmark, and of institutional design. I will return to this later, and I think that um, the paper by Francesco Mongelli will have to say something about this. Third important part in the diagnostic, disparities change over time under various dimensions. If you look at some macro indicators, per capita, real and nominal incomes, unemployment, price indexes, they show a clear pre-crisis convergence um, versus post-crisis divergence pattern, and then uh, some symptoms are converges again after the hard times of the crisis seems we hope behind us. There is a second critical question, uh, cyclical versus structural components. Uh, something has already been said by Luigi. Distinction is very important, but it's very difficult, so we have to be careful. And um, more in-depth analysis provide nuanced results, more micro-analysis provide nuanced results. Some indicators have improved, others have worsened, and there has been, according to some study, a reshuffling of the north-south divide. So it's not like, let's say, 10 years or before the crisis. Uh, fourth, very controversial issue, very complicated perhaps complicated more than controversial. Is it all about competitiveness? Uh, competitiveness is the promised land of structural reforms par excellence, yet is surrounded by some, let me also add outdated uh, misconceptions. Um, let me just remind one point made by Krugman many, many years ago. Competitiveness, if you want, if you want to use word precisely, is a microeconomic notion that concern FIM's ability to contend market shares. Its extension to countries is a semantic degeneration quite harmful to clean economic reasoning. Uh, what is relevant uh, to the, let me call, uh, wealth of nations is their overall economic efficiency. Countries are efficient or inefficient. Firms can be competitive or not competitive. And efficient in generated value added to be distributed. Um, the competitiveness, competitiveness of firms is, of course, intrinsic with efficiency, but there is no such a clear one-to-one -one automatic matching between the two dimensions. And uh, Luigi already mentioned some uh, recent research, which is very important, that uh, allow us to understand that is a very complex picture. The, the efficiency factors that affect a country or a region are very complex, re require very deep analysis, and uh, what emerges dismantles two simple uh, beliefs and indicators. And one of these regards the almost exclusive focus on the net, net trade balance as an indicator of health or unhealth uh, of, a, of a country. Now, coming to the second dimension, external imbalances, I will touch quickly three issues. Uh, again, is a claim to be at, to to pay more attention to complexities and not to e easygoing uh, uh, um, representation of the fact. Let me start from um, 
a very, very well known view put forward by Blanchard and Javazzi in 2012 that I call dynamic equilibrium view, who remind us that uh, current account imbalance may be, may be the right modus operandi of highly integrated free markets, channeling capitals and goods from lower external locations in mature economies to higher return location in emerging economies. So in the long run, current account imbalance would take care of themselves. And this, there is a strong uh, implication, policy or normative implication, struggling for market deregulation and integration and then evoking self-sufficiency appears as an oddity. We have to, at that time, let the market work. Uh, yet, sustainability is a key issue, but far more complicated than simple current account uh, accounting. Uh, an example, there is a, a large literature where, which can we have to look at to understand current account, financial accounts, all their intricacies and pitfalls. Um, you know, financial liberalization um, unleashes the forces that create by themselves the complementarities between surplus and deficit countries that we observe exposed in the international accounts. From this point of view, since today financial capitals move far more massively and quickly than other factors and goods, the hypothesis, a very old hypothesis, uh, that capital movements cause current account imbalances rather than the other way around has become more likely. So that's, of course, changes the, the picture a little bit. As scholars in international finance teach us, net figures may be highly misleading. So focus of attention should be shifted from character count imbalances to the underlying net tangle, call it as you like, borrowing and lending relationships. Uh, this opens up a little bit of debate of the right interpretation of what happened. And I will be very quickly here, and Luigi has already ex explain the various nuances of what is, has happened, but perhaps what is uh, uh, put under question is, was it a balance of payment crisis, what happened in the Eurozone in those years? Um, the consensus narrative you see here, the well-known sequence, for many authors falls short of a completely convincing explanation in several points. Um, one is that, as already said, uh, external, just net external balances are not a sufficient indicator for sustainability. It depends on many other factors, depending also on the quality and return of assets and liabilities uh, for each country. Second, the rationale for sudden stop in a monetary union cannot be the anticipation of a balance of payment crisis like it was in the very well, well, originating paper by Calvo, because no claims in other than fiat money exist in a monetary union. So the rationale for the sudden stop problem in a monetary union can only be the insolvency of borrowers as in any other financial relationships, not the residence of the lenders, right? Uh, so if the misallocation view uh, uh, makes a point, then the bug <laughs> in the Blanchard-Javazzi prediction that every, every, everything was going well is the efficient capital market hypothesis. So that's the point should, we should look at. And in this perspective, the sudden stop view also fails to address the issue whether the stop was triggered by the specific problems of the borrowers in the Eurozone, Eurozone deficit countries was a domestic in the sense of the EMU crisis, or it was rather the Europeanization of a generalized stop of global lending due to the well-known uh, consequence of the global crisis. Okay, so um, policy implications with a prediction instead of a conclusion. Um, uh, f from this point of view, there is uh, a, the emerge two key messages with respect to the IMF, uh, sorry, MIP 
um, uh, apparatus. One concern, the first is that concern with economic disparities across and within countries, when these grow large, is motivated by their threat to welfare, cohesion, membership, functionality of the Eurozone as a whole. Yet the present MIP apparatus plus Eurozone governance system is a little bit ill-suited. On the other hand, the open economy macroeconomics reason put forward for monitoring and correcting current account imbalances is a, can, can turn out to be misleading. So the message is cure the disease uh, not the symptoms. And the disease, to put it in a slogan, are microeconomic imbalances, microeconomic divergency are more important, are the real problem, not the macroeconomic dimension that they, they, they may take. Um, addressing economic disparity. Uh, two points, how small should, can, or can disparity be? Uh, you know, identification of disparities should go with an assessment of the system's capacity to withstand them. Uh, and this, we know, varies a lot around the world as a result of historical, cultural, and institutional factors. And institutions around the world are designed as means both of reduction and coexistence of disparity. Um, in the Eurozone, it seems to me, it seems that the conventional wisdom is that the normative benchmark seems tendentially zero disparities because the Eurozone appears particularly ill-suited to withstand internal disparity for a lo large number of reasons that we know very well. But in this view, reform proposals are tilted towards the reduction of disparity with little or no room for the balancing aim of also governing their coexistence. And these constraint set a stress, put itself under stress the existence of the disparities. Uh, second important point, who should do what? Uh, another pillar of conventional wisdom is that each national government should take care of its own laggards, and, but this plea is a bit oversimplistic. In standalone countries, structural convergence policy, other than fiscal transfers, huh? are typically duty of central governments with perhaps local corrections in form of tax or incentive policy. The reasons for this are the classic ones in the theory of multi-level governance. The point is that these policies do have all the characteristics that may create an incentive, an advantage to centralize. They have externalities, they have a nature of public goods. There is no clear incentive for each government alone to uh, pursue convergence policy. And in general, we know that decentralized policy making in this context leads to non-cooperative solutions, okay? Uh, addressing financial stability and efficiency. So this is the real problem. I don't uh, have to say much more. Already has been said in other sessions of the conference. So the key, the key point is that we should put up all the necessary uh, lessons that other countries are also drawn from the crisis. Microprudential regulation, macroprudential regulation, and by and large, okay, let's try to put up a decent banking union, not the MIP. That's the, 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 the key message. The question is, the final question before the prediction is, does the Eurozone has, as it is, have the right institutions and tools up to the task? Uh, this is my own judgment. I, I, I am rather pessimistic because, you see, I see these three, these three points. So first, a multi-level division of competencies is not possible in the EMU because national sovereignty interest is intangible, okay. Then we have a catch-22. As long as structural reforms are not accomplished, no supranational fiscal institution can be created in the fear of moral hazard and fiscal transfers. And finally, we have that the existing EMU supranational institution 
or their hypothetical transformation into technocratic executive agency have neither competencies nor legitimacies to go beyond recommendations and moral suasion in a liberal Europe. If you have any other solution. Okay. So my prediction, uh, EU members remain entrapped in a maze of rules whose rationale is not to govern a genuine monetary union but the European Monetary System 2.0, which is an odd creature with the single monetary authority, irrevocably fixed exchange rates, limited sovereignty, enough to make inconsistent policy, by the way, no common stabilization and rebalancing mechanism. I do hope to be falsified. Perhaps Francesco is going to falsify me. Ha, 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 ha.